We're going to go through this really fast. I'm going to introduce covalent compounds and ionic compounds to you. And then in the next section, we'll, sh we'll show how to name them. So really just a, a few slides, but there's a ton of information on here. Do not expect to really understand this until, uh, until you practice it a lot. All right, so first of all, what's a molecular compound and what's an ionic compound? So electrons participate in chemical reactions by being either gained, lost, or shared. The gaining or losing of electrons results in the formation of anions. And when they gain them, when one gains, the other one loses, right? So a sodium atom, for example, might look like this, where it has a, a 11 protons because it's sodium, right? This is also a sodium, it has 11 protons, but a sodium atom has 11 electrons. And a sodium ion, right, if it's plus, has got 10 electrons, it's got fewer. Why? Because it donated its electron to somebody or something, right? The periodic, the periodic table can, can, uh, can serve as a guide for predicting the ionic charge of main group elements. Group ones typically lose one electron and they become a plus one. This is cool. Right? Group 1 becomes plus 1. Group 2, they typically lose 2 to form a cation with a plus 2 charge. Right? Many nonmetals gain electrons. That's the other side of the periodic table. So group 17, that's the halogens, they typically gain 1 electron and they end up with a charge of minus 1. Group 16, which I said I wasn't going to say the name of these, gain 2 electrons. Don't worry about it. Group 16 gains two electrons. They form an anion with a two minus charge. Okay? So predicting ionic charge. So for example, calcium in group two is going to end up with a two plus charge. Bromine in group uh, in group 17 sometimes we say seven because there's a couple ways we number these things, it's going to typically take on a minus one, right? And can you see where I'm going with this? Now that we know, uh, let, let me, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to scroll up the periodic table. I really should have one of these in here. These guys, let me go here, typically lose one electron and become a plus one. These guys typically lose two electrons and become plus two. These guys don't do anything. These guys gain an electron and become a minus one. These ones gain two electrons and become minus two. And oftentimes, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus gain three electrons and become minus three, but not always. And carbon is all over the place. So we don't really make any predictions for those boron and carbon. We could, there's, there's some things to, to, to get, but if you want a really good rock solid rules, check out those, right? Plus one, plus two, minus one, minus two. And we don't care about the noble gases because they're in the domain of physics. Right, so let's go back to where we were. All right, so positive charges of cations are equal to the group number. The negative charges of cations are equal to the distance that you move from the left of the noble gas, which, was, which I was sort of saying just a second ago. This method is less reliable for transition metals. So the things in between, I said nothing about the guys in between, right? because we don't know, right? That we have to look up, or you have to be told that. So these are all plus ones, these are all plus twos, minus ones, minus twos. A lot of times these are minus threes. That's pretty reliable. This is less reliable. Those, those ones are less reliable. And in here, you can see there's no real trend. Plus three, plus six, plus two. Iron can be plus two or plus three. Cobalt plus two, nickel plus two. What, right? So you really can't make predictions about the stuff in the middle. You make predictions about these groups and these groups. Okay? Now, polyatomic ions are ions that have more than one atom in them. So far, the ions we were talking about were monatomic ions, right? It's just one atom gaining or losing an electron. But a polyatomic has got lots of, of uh, atoms in it. Oxo anions are polyatomic anions that contain one or more oxygen atoms, right? So here's some common polyatomic ions. Here's a polyatomic ion. It's got five atoms in it, four hydrogen and a nitrogen, right? And it's got a plus. By the way, there's only two pluses in this whole table, right? 
and uh, but they're all these are all ions, and these should be memorized. You will eventually memorize these. Okay, so here's acetate. It looks really. It also looks like this C two H three O two minus. Can you see? This is sort of a condensed structural formula. Here's a structural. Here's a molecular formula, right? It's got a minus one on it. That's acetate. Here's hydroxide. That's an oxo anion. Here's an oxo anion. Nah, we don't really call that because peroxides, you know, usually when we say oxo anions, we're talking about stuff like this. See all those oxygen atoms? Those are all oxo anions. And these all need to be memorized. The names of those need to be memorized. They'll, they'll really save you a lot of grief later if those are easy for you. I'll show you later how to memorize if you ask me. So, and here's some more common polyatomic ions. And these are also oxo anions. Can you see the, all the oxygen atoms in here? By the way, there's a trend here, perchlorate, chlorate, chlorite, and hypochlorite, right? There's a trend there. Not necessarily a trend that you could discern here, but these will be easier to memorize if you memorize them in a group. All right, so now when we're naming oxo anions, we use, we use a system. Let me use sulfate as an example. Sulfate is two minus, and sulfite is also two minus. So it is when it has a smaller number of oxygen atoms in it, right? This is it, right? And here's eight, right? Because you see this has got four oxygen atoms in it. This one has three, okay? Uh, chlorite and chlorate, right? This has got fewer. It's got two. This says three. So this is going to be eight, and this is going to be it. I'm sorry, my handwriting there. Let me get rid of that and do that again. Eight and eight, right? Because it has fewer. That's what this rule is. Eight is got uh, is the suffix when you have an oxo and then with a larger number of oxygen atoms in it. Eight is when you've got a smaller number of oxygen atoms in it. Okay. Per means we have even more. That's the largest number. And hypo is when we've got the smallest number. And these will make more sense when you take some practice, take some time to practice those. All right. Now, types of chemical bonds are as follows. Uh, an ionic bond is when electrons are transferred. Although there are some chemists, including me, who don't like to call that a bond. Why? Because it's really just an electrostatic interaction. Still, everybody calls them bonds, so I'm going to call them bonds too. Now, when electrons are shared, that's when we really do have a bond. And that's called a covalent bond. Again, I'm going to call these ionic bonds, even though they're not really bonds. Okay, and covalent bonds. Compounds are classified as ionic if they've got ionic um, bonds in them, and molecular if they don't. Okay. So metals readily lose electrons, and so they're going to form cations. Nonmetals readily gain electrons, so they're going to form anions. If you have a metal and a nonmetal, you're going to have a transfer. This is going to be ionic. Okay? Metals and, and nonmetals generally form ionic compounds. So it becomes very easy. If you're looking at a formula and you see a metal, you know it's ionic. All right? That's, it's that simple. We're not going to deal with metallic bonds in this class, so we're going to keep it at that for now. All right, so let's go down. Where was I? All right, we already did that one. All right, down. Let's look at some examples now. We have, if we're going to combine sodium and chlorine, then we know sodium is in group one, so it's generally going to take on a plus one charge. And chlorine is, an, is a halogen. It's in group seven or 17, depending on which, which um, table you're looking at. Again, we number those differently, okay? So I'm going to call them group seven a lot, but the one that OpenStax uses has it labeled as 17. That is going to take on a minus one charge. And this is just a one-to-one -one ratio, right? So since it's one-to-one, -one, we're just going to know that that's going to go to sodium and chlorine. We'll describe how to name this in the next uh, section. Calcium, on the other hand, is in group two. So it's going to have a tendency to take on a plus two. And chlorine is in group 17, so it's going to take on a minus one. You can see it's going to take two minuses to account for that plus two, right? And so the formula you're going to get with calcium chloride is going to be CaCl2. Properties of ionic compounds are as follows. They have very high melting points, very high boiling points, very, very high. When they're solid, they are non-conductive. They will do not conduct electricity. But when, they're, when they've been melted, then they do conduct electricity. 
Here's a picture of that. I think I'm going to move on. Look at that melting point. That's high. Very high melting point. And it conducts electricity when it's molten. So here's the light bulb. I said I wasn't going to go right past it. See, it's off, right? But as soon as we heat this up and melt it, right, we're, me we're heating it up and melting it, then boom, light bulb goes on, okay, because it's, con it's uh, conductive when it's molten. Okay, so ionic compounds are electrically neutral overall, so if you have an ionic compound, you've got to make sure that the plus charges and the minus charges match up. So they're always going to be in the lowest, let's see, the lowest common multiple of charges, right? So plus three and minus two, they don't go, they go evenly in the six, right? So it's going to take two of these and three of these to make a six. And there you go, right? Lowest common multiples. Okay. Um, uh, I think I want to skip this slide. I just want to move on. So many ionic compounds contain polyatomic ions as the cation or anion or both. Treat polyatomic ions as if they're one piece, right? So there's phosphate. And if you if you recognize phosphate, if this memorized as polyatomic ion, it becomes much easier to start balancing things, okay? So there's a polyatomic ion called phosphate, phosphate, that's right, phosphate, and there's calcium. And uh, so if you treat that as if it's one unit, it's much easier to deal with. This, this is going to be, since calcium is plus 2, this is minus 3. The lowest common multiple of this is going to be 6, so it's going to take 3 of these and 2 of these, and that's what I got. There's my 2, and there's my 3. Okay. All right, now molecular compounds are much simpler. Molecular compounds result when atoms share electrons. They exist as discrete neutral molecules. And they are formed by the combination of nonmetals, and they often exist as gases, low boiling liquids, or low melting solids. So the melting point of molecular compounds. I realize I'm not saying a whole lot about this. Ionic is much more interesting uh, for for this um, topic, but because these are so simple, right? They there there's no metals in them, and they have low melting points, low boiling points, and they often exist as gases. All right. And so in the next section, we are going to name them, and that's going to be a beast. So hold on to your hats.